Hi there, my name is Aaron Lancherman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. Here in the 20th lecture of the summer 2020 offering of EC3084 signals and systems, we'll look at a property called the frequency shift property. Now we've previously seen a time shift property where say if we were to subtract T0 in time, gives you a multiplication in the frequency domain by e to the minus j omega t naught. So for this derivation, for a variety, I'm going to come at it from the other direction and ask what happens if you multiply a frequency in the time domain by e to the j omega naught t. At first glance, it seems fairly unmotivated, but just go with the flow for now. So let's use the same proof technique we used to prove the delayed property where we inserted this x t minus t naught into the Fourier transform. Let's do the same thing here by putting e to the j omega naught into the Fourier transform. So here we'll take the Fourier transform of e to the j omega naught t xt, and the Fourier transform integral has us integrating against e to the minus j omega t dt. We can combine the exponents. Let's write this as e to the minus omega minus omega naught times t x of t dt. And now if I look at this, this looks like a Fourier transform, but in a slightly different way that we haven't seen before. This thing looks like a Fourier transform, but we don't have omega here. We have an omega minus omega naught. So what we have is that the Fourier transform is the Fourier transform of x of t, which we're calling big X, but it's evaluated at omega minus omega naught. Okay, let me move this over a bit to make some space. And I'll write this as big X j omega minus omega naught. Now, if we wanted to, we could have proved this time shift property that we proved a couple of lectures ago with the same kind of technique except in that case, we would be using an inverse Fourier transform. So we will need to put a one over two pi out in front. We would be doing this integral over omega. There would be a plus here instead of a minus, and the naught would go on the time instead of omega. And what would we be inverse transforming? Well, we would be inverse transforming big X J omega. And we also need this to be a minus because we have a minus here. All right, so if we propagate those changes through, we would now have j omega t minus t naught. So now this whole thing looks like the inverse transform of big X, which would normally be X of t, except we don't have a t here. We have a t minus t naught. So it's the inverse transform of big X, which is X, but now it's evaluated at t minus t naught. So that's an alternate proof to the proof we did the last time. The last time, a couple of lectures ago, we put x of t minus t naught into the forward integral. Here we are putting this e minus j omega naught t big X j omega into the inverse Fourier transform integral to have a proof more along the lines of what we just did. So the proof of this property that we started the lecture with started with multiplying little x by e to the j omega naught t, and that probably felt a little bit unmotivated. If we wanted, we could start with the shifted version of the Fourier transform we see over here, and that would be closer to the kind of proof we did for the shift in the time domain a couple of lectures ago. Let's try that out. So here we'll need to use the inverse Fourier transform. So careful not to forget the 1 over 2 pi. So we're inverse transforming the Fourier transform evaluated at omega minus omega naught e to the plus j omega t d omega because we're going back to the time domain. So here, as we did a couple of lectures ago, let's do a change of variables. Here, let me write omega tilde is equal to omega minus omega naught omega equals omega tilde plus omega naught. The differential exchange will be d omega turns into just d omega tilde. Nothing is very exciting there. If I didn't have infinities up here, I would have to think about it a bit more, but this is a case where the change of variable just involves adding or subtracting something from infinity or minus infinity. So luckily here, those don't change. So I'll rewrite this as one over two pi 
big X J omega tilde times E to the plus J omega tilde plus omega naught T D omega. So this splits up into E to the J omega tilde T times E to the J omega naught T. The bit with the omega naught T here, that's constant with respect to omega tilde. Sorry, I forgot to add that tilde earlier. So that can be pulled out in front. And I can rewrite this whole thing as e to the j omega naught t times 1 over 2 pi integral, forgot this is going from minus infinity to infinity, big X j omega e to the j omega tilde t d omega tilde. And now this whole thing here just looks like little x of t because it's the inverse transform of big X j omega without anything else weird going on. So that gives me my e to the j omega naught t times x of t, which is what you see up here. So between this and lecture 18, you've now seen two different properties, each proven two different ways. So a few lectures from now, we will see why being able to move things around in the frequency domain is particularly useful. One thing I want to warn you about is that the resulting function here, in general, is not a real valued function. And this is very useful because we're used to seeing real valued functions in time. If x of t is real valued, then we see frequency domain representations always have a conjugate symmetry. In the case of Fourier series, if x of t was periodic, we have that a minus k is equal to a k complex conjugate. Back in EC 2026, and I should mention that this is for discrete time signals, in 2026, if x of n was real, you have the conjugate symmetry big X e to the j omega hat evaluated at negative omega hat is equal to big X e to the j omega hat, that discrete time Fourier transform complex conjugated. For a continuous time x of t, if x of t here is real valued, then we have the same kind of conjugate symmetry except now for the continuous time Fourier transform. But in this particular case, this is probably not going to be real valued, right? Because this guy is complex. So this big X does not have that kind of symmetry, unless you had some kind of strange little X of T. Let's move this frequency shift property down a bit. And we'll recall from previous lectures that Fourier transform pairs have a vague kind of symmetry. For instance, delta t minus t naught transforms into e to the minus j omega t naught. And we also saw that 2 pi delta omega minus omega naught in the frequency domain inverse transforms into e to the j omega naught t in the time domain. So we have this interesting kind of symmetry. Deltas in one domain transform into complex exponentials in the other domain, modulo a few differences, like there's a plus in front of the j here where there's a minus in front of the j over here, and we have a 2 pi over here, but you do have this intriguingly interestingly similar structure. The properties you can prove about Fourier transforms usually have a similar kind of structure to the base Fourier transform pairs. Here we have shifts corresponding to multiplication by complex exponentials in time. Again, modulo a few variations, such as the minus here and the plus over here. There's another property that I haven't explicitly proved, but we've used quite a bit, which says that if we take two functions and convolve them, that corresponds to multiplying their Fourier transforms. I'm using the functions f and g here instead of x and h because I want to emphasize that this is a general property and doesn't necessarily have to apply to an impulse response. There's a flipped variation of this, as you might expect, that says if we multiply functions in time, leave a little space here, this corresponds to convolving their Fourier transforms. We've seen convolution in time. Convolution in frequency is just the same thing. You just have a different horizontal axis. Except there is this little tweak of needing to have 1 over 2 pi sitting out in front. Again, all of these various pairs that have these interesting bits of pseudosymmetry, there's always some variation, like having a plus or minus be different, or having a 2 pi showing up somewhere, crashing on your couch and never quite leaving. So back in lecture 18, we showed how we could prove this time shift function by using this convolution in time property combined with 
the knowledge of the Fourier transform of our delta function, because convolving a function with delta t minus t naught corresponds to a shift of t naught. And convolving our knowledge of that transform pair with the fact that convolution time equals multiplication frequency gives us our Fourier transform property. So we can play the same games here. Now that we have this multiplication and time property, it's often called a modulation property, and we'll see why that terminology is used in a future lecture, we could write this Fourier transform as an original Fourier transform big X of j omega convolved with delta omega minus omega naught. Here we could compare what we've called f with big X of j omega, and we could call g here 2 pi delta omega minus omega naught. Notice I'm putting a 2 pi here so it can cancel with the 2 pi in the denominator, hence giving us what we see here. And then on the other side of the special case, what would we have? Well, ft would correspond to xt, and g would correspond to, according to this Fourier transform pair here, e to the j omega naught t, which is what we're trying to prove here. So that's yet a third way of proving this property. So in real life, multiplying by a complex exponential is kind of a thing you can do, although it's a strange thing to do. We'll talk about how you might actually do this in a future lecture. But for right now, let's try to stick with multiplying things by real valued sinusoids. How about let's multiply x of t by cosine omega naught t? Well, of course, we could plug this into the Fourier transform integral, yada, 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 but a much more natural approach would be to use the Fourier transform pairs we already have by rewriting the cosine via Euler's formula. So I'll write this as e to the plus j omega naught t plus one half e to the minus j omega naught t all times x of t. So we can use this property here to say that this is going to transform into one half big X j omega minus omega naught plus one half big X j omega plus omega naught. Here we're shifting big X to the right on the frequency axis, and here we're shifting it to the left on the frequency axis. So assuming that X is real, multiplying it by this cosine will still have a real function. So we would have a structure here that maintains that conjugate symmetry in the Fourier domain. Of course, if x of t isn't real valued, if it is complex valued, then all bets are off. And in a future lecture, I will use this property to lie to you a little bit about how AM radio works.